Good, good morning, everybody. Um, I think we, we still have people joining the call here uh, this morning. Apologies, we had a slight technical issue, um, even after two and a half years of COVID and Zoom and our COVID and the Zoom and Teams calls. Anyway, we're uh, we're delighted here this morning to be able to uh, have a, a Fingal Business Forum in conjunction with Fingal County Council. Um, my name is Anthony Cooney and uh, I'm hosting the event here this morning from our offices in, in, in Dublin Airport. And uh, just to mention about the council, we as a Chamber of Commerce work very collaboratively with Fingal County Council across a wide a number of uh, issues pertaining to the business community. And we do recognize the very good work they do across all of those sectors. I'm joined here this morning by the Chief Executive of Fingal County Council, Ms. Anne-Marie Farrelly, and uh, John Quinlevin, the Director of Services, Economic Enterprise, Tourism and Cultural Development. Uh, we will, uh, Anne-Marie will go through the presentation shortly. And as she goes through it, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat box. and. Uh, I'll channel the questions then. We, I can see them here, and I'll channel the questions then at the end to Anne-Marie. So, Anne-Marie, if it's okay with you, I'll get the good morning to you. Good morning, Anthony, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here this morning. I see some names I recognise and others I don't. So, just to give you a brief introduction to myself, um, Anne-Marie Farley, Chief Executive here in Fingal through 2019. Um, a career of public servant. Um, I began, began my career in Dublin County Council and I've worked in Fingal since um, it was formed in 1994. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with the county and it's a, it's a county I'm passionate about, always anxious to do the right thing and to make sure it's a good place to, to live, work and visit. Um, so that, that's principally what our day job is about. Glad to be joined by John Quinlevin here today. He's the Director of Economic Development. But I have a strong management team in addition to John um, who work across all the various directors in, directorates in the county, um, basically trying to drive forward the county from, from the perspective of economic development, but also as a, as a place to live um, and making the county a good place, essentially. I wanted to give you a sense of the scale of the county and the scale of the business that we're operating here in Fingal. Um, it's grown significantly since I joined in 2019. And before that, um, our population has consistently grown um, from, from a low, I suppose, back in 1994 to now, you know, 300,000. But also it's, you know, very much recognized now as being part of Dublin, the Dublin region. Um, obviously the benefit of the economic activity we have in the county is something that is really good for the local authority. But I also hope what we do is good for your business. Um, and happy to discuss through you know the, the presentation that I'm making today, but also your perspective of doing business in the county um, later on in the meeting today. Um, so our budget for 2023 is a strong budget. Um, I know Anthony's going to move on the slides there. Um, we have a budget of 333 million. I suppose it's no surprise when you think about what's in the news at the moment that most of our budget is spent on housing and building. Um, and I suppose from that perspective, um, the, the income for that comes principally from government and of course from our social tenants. So it's very much self-financing. Um, in terms of the, the rest of our priorities, operationally from our road transport and safety and also our recreation and amenity, key spend areas for the county. They're the two areas that make the county, I suppose, feel and look different. That's what makes your towns and villages um, look um, clean and well maintained. That's where we spend our operational budget um, for those areas. Moving on then to our capital budget, again, a major significant spend of almost a billion um, planned up to 2025. So suppose the benefit I have now that I'm three years in, um, heading into the fourth year, is that um, a lot of the projects that were at inception when I came in are now either on site or about to go on site. We've put a lot of effort into our housing, making sure that we have many projects ready to go. I mean, in this year, we'll have 13 projects, 13 housing sites 
open um, where we're building social housing. And that compares to 68 sites that are privately owned that are constructing building. So you can see that we're a major player in housing construction. And um, the funding for that comes from government, um, but it's, it's more than half of our capital spend. And um, we have also exciting plans, and we'll go through that later on in terms of active travel, also protecting the heritage, you know, those heritage properties, um, Malahide Castle or Gillen, Newbridge, um, always protecting those so that they're better um, um, each year with our investment. And then, of course, Swords Castle here, where we're developing the Swords Cultural Quarter. Anybody who lives in, or works in Swords will have seen that we've now closed our car park on the top of Seatown Road. That's because the enabling works are beginning next week for the Swords um, Library, Art Centre and Theatre, um, and that's going to begin construction this year. So the enabling works dealing with the archaeology and the site infrastructure works will happen from next week. So a big change in, in the town of Swords, but also, I suppose, protecting that heritage, heritage piece of Swords Castle. Um, on an active travel perspective, we'll go through the details of the projects later on. But you'll see, I suppose, and it's something I want to alert businesses to, you'll see that construction happening in every town and village. So just so that you know what it is, we'll be planning it in a way that will be the least disruptive. Um, but we want to hear from you if there's any issues in relation to those construction projects. But you see, any entity that's about to spend a billion in the county, I hope will have spin off benefits to, to other businesses and make sure that you know we keep, keep some of that economic growth within the county, but also, of course, make the place just better as a place to live and do business. Um, just in terms of where the money comes from that capital spend, um, grants, as I mentioned, largely for the housing um, and the active travel um, investment, a lot of that funding coming from government as a local authority, I have to be ready to spend that money. So when it's available from government, and it is a key priority for government um, right now, obviously the delivery of housing and the deliver delivery of um, active travel, I need to be ready to spend it. So you'll see that we have teams working in those areas. That's where um, we have prioritized our activity, trying to get that money into the county, first of all, and then secondly, the benefits of having better active travel and also trying to deal with that housing issue, which, I suppose, I suppose I, I would say from my perspective, the scale of our activity in that area will yield benefits in the coming year. Um, we will, I suppose we're safer and feel better than we have for quite some time in terms of housing delivery because we know and we can see in sight where the projects are going to either get started or already um, about to deliver housing. So I just wanted to give you that certainty that, you know, there is a plan and we're working very strongly to it. Development contributions come in as well um, and that th those funding um, they come with the development that happens both from housing and from a commercial perspective. Um, we have a good, strong activity in the county. It didn't stall at all during COVID. You'll have seen the likes of the, um, the warehousing, for example, that was de de delivered between the N2 and the M1 um, along the M50 fringe there right through COVID. Huge spin-off from, I guess, from the airport, but from other activity in terms of um, new um, international companies coming in to locate in the county and um, they've yielded some levies for us that's important because we have to protect the road infrastructure and make sure that we invest in that all of the time to make sure people can get to and from work and i'll go through the through some of the projects that are happening um, in order to deal with some of those issues um, we have to provide some of the funding ourselves through our revenue budget you'll find that spend will happen in the likes of our economic development areas for tourism projects, heritage protection and, and other um, issues. Um, but a good strong spend and we're ready to spend it is what I'd say. You know, we see those projects getting closer to site if they're not already on site. So you'll see that activity happening again right throughout the county. Then I mentioned just um, on the next slide, the, our, strong, <clears throat> our strong management team. So I'm going to go through what each of them does, um, what each director each department is responsible for. No more than any other organization with a staff of 1600, you know, we're a big entity. We need to make sure that we have a good working environment and that we, we get the most out of our people. Um, we have embraced blended working as many have for those that are eligible. 
half of those have opted to work the three days in the office and two days remote. We're well equipped. We rolled out our digital strategy at the very beginning of COVID um, at a pace so that we were ready from, I think, with it two months in to, to work seamlessly from home or in the office. So um, that's well in place. It's working, it's working well. We are finding it difficult to retain staff. There's a lot of opportunities for our staff right across um, the public and private sectors. So we have to compete like, like I know many of your businesses do to try and retain staff. And that hybrid working is, is, does help us do that. Um, our elected members, of course, as well, operating in the same way, which gives them benefits. They're part-time councillors. You know, it's important that they, we make it as easy as possible for them to do their job. So that hybrid option works well for them as well. Um, we've just presented our annual report to, to council last night. That's what we did last year. We have a service delivery plan and um, about what we're going to do this year. Um, and of course, our budget, the revenue capital that I've just brought you through. So very strong governance in the council. Um, we're very much controlled by the policy program set by our council. Um, and that's the, the strategy we work to as a management team. Um, and of course, we've just come through the Fingal Development Plan, which is the five year planning policy for the county, came, became effective last Thursday. Um, now it's the planning policy program for the next five years. What land is suitable for commercial development? What's suitable for housing, recreation and amenity and all those other land uses that you'll see around the county? Um, operationally, I suppose any local government our local authority, in my view, should have their priority, their county. What does their county look like, feel like to be in? You know, does it have a high standard of maintenance? Is there high quality work happening in the county? Um, we have given priority that, to that operational piece, driven by the director, Mary T. Daly. Um, again, we um, have allocated more resources into this area during COVID and beyond it right now we have additional funding available to us and that's about us spending the money in your local area making sure that the place is, place looks well. The type of work we do is uh, about keeping the regional local roads um, fit for purpose. On the public lighting side we have now 96% of our public lighting LED which obviously has delivered huge dividends in terms of energy efficiency, but also, I suppose, bit recognised as being so important when the cost associated with electricity has gone up. We weren't hit as badly um, through the increase in costs because we had that work complete. Um, public lighting is our main energy user in the county. Um, traffic management and parking, road openings from the perspective of all the utilities, we're still one of those counties where where the, the, the demand from business is high, the demand from com communities is high, and the utilities are working here constantly. We try to make that as efficient as possible, and make them to be, be as efficient as possible. But again, um, huge demand, quite a busy area for us. The street cleaning and recycling centers, um, a big priority for me in terms of trying to deal with those little black spots, making sure we're a clean county. We have, allocated a lot of resources into that area. Um, and I think it is yielding divid dividends. I think we have a good reputation um, for being a clean county and we certainly want to keep it. Um, our regional parks and open spaces, um, considerable amount of work in that area. The regional parks, I suppose, serve the region almost destinations at this stage. So we draw in visitors, two million visitors to Malahide Castle and Domain um, each year. And there are people that just go to the park to enjoy it, you know, and we're pleased that that's happening. We have new regional parks in development. We're looking at the River Valley in Swords because we now own a lot more of the land in that location and we're developing it as a regional park. It's performed more as a local park up to now. Um, and that master plan will be going for planning this year. Again, a major investment. And similarly with Braymore and Balbriggan, where the castle is there, but a lot of land available to us to develop as a park. And the planning is in place for that. So you'll see more developments happening in that area. Anyone who knows Bad Riggan will see that O'Dwyer's, the GAA club have developed 
their own facility in that location. And that was to do with a commercial transaction that we, we um, entered into with O'Dwyer's, where we are, will be developing their land, their original site, where they are located presently um, for housing and other purposes. Um, and we'll be bringing planning through on that in the coming year or so. Playing pitches in big demand, Young County, as you know, um, a lot of demand from all sports codes. We're developing a lot of projects there. I'll bring you through those later. Um, and I'm not going to go through the rest um, other than to say, please to now have a Harbour Master in place, for, particularly for, for Skerries and Balbriggan. A lot of work to be done in those harbours and a lot of planning underway to try and get some better maintenance work there and also some guidance for the people who use the harbours so that we protect them at all times, make them more to be amenities than anything else. And then moving on, I suppose we will just talk to you, but the, the priorities are set out there. Um, I won't go through the list, but more of the same, I suppose, doing more, um, spending our money wisely, making sure it's invested well, um, but also making sure that the place, the county looks better as a result. So again, a lot of work to be done at all times in a county this size with the population we're serving. I'm gonna focus a bit on housing next, and then that's led by director Robert Burns. Um, I mentioned that we have 13 um, projects on site, um, those five in January and February now started, um, and the next three about to start. Um, we have plans for that in excess of 3,000 homes and more pipeline being developed all of the time. So that's social housing predominantly, although some of our sites are mixed tenure. Delighted last week that Ballam Stone, which is a large site, in, for 1,200 units in Donna Bait. The first phase of that received planning permission from a board planola last week, and I'm hopeful that will get to site soon. That's a uh, private uh, venture we have, we're in with Glenvay Developments. They were successful in the tender, and we're hopeful they'll get to site pretty quickly and ultimately build out those units. Fabulous site there along the distributor road, fantastic views of the coast, um, within walking distance of the train station. Um, as I say, what's not to like, I expect everybody will want to live in those homes when they're developed. Um, to bring you through some further projects that we have um, on the next slide there, a new site that we're developing presently is Church Fields in, in Mulhuddard. Again, about a thousand homes. We are in the last stage of tender for the 300 homes. Um, again, to get on site in September. But that's more about just housing. You know, we're delivering a, a major park there. We're upgrading park at a park in the area for the existing residents as well. A new um, distributor road there, which links the Damastown Industrial Estate right into the heart of um, Dublin 15. So again, more about more than about housing, it will deal with some of those traffic issues, deliver active travel for the workers in the industrial estate as well. So it's a complicated project and I suppose, just to make the point, it's much easier for us to open a site and develop, develop 300 social homes. Um, that's a quicker project to deliver. It's a project that's paid for directly by government. Um, you don't have to worry about selling homes at the end of it. Um, so the timeline for 300 homes that are social is probably um, about 18 months or two years quicker to deliver if we only delivered social homes. But in this area, we're trying to improve the tenure mix. A lot of social homes there already. So that's why we wanted 60% private homes in the area. And it's a more complicated project that depends on some private funding as well. So the procurement and the development strategy does take a bit longer, but we, I suppose, always strive to do the right thing. And this will be a good development when it's built out. Um, and those 300 homes will be on site in September. Some homes already built in this area um, in some infill sites, and they're opening right now with new homes. I think it's 130 homes will be occupied before the mid-year um, and they're, they're principally social homes. Moving on, another just small scheme I'll dwell on, but it's on the Rathby Road here in Swords. On the next slide, um, again, a small apartment scheme on an infill site. 
um, of uh, 11, 1, 2 and 3 bed apartments. And again, that was an old depot that we had. So just to show that we try and identify suitable sites for housing and get them build, built as a result. But a state of the art project, you know, um, very um, modern design and um, very energy efficient um, with a green roof from the biodiversity perspective as well. So again, a good scheme that you'll see ultimately completed in, within the next 12 months or so. The budget in housing has gone up. I mentioned it's mostly um, funded by government. That's a, operationally and from a capital perspective. I was director of housing back in 20, I left in 2015, I think from 2012 to 2015. At that time, we had about 5,000 social homes. So we're now managing 6,400 social homes. So you can see the scale of increase and the pace during that time. Um, there's other schemes coming in, of course, from government to try and maximize um, potential of the area and every local authority area. That Cree Kona House scheme is proven very successful. It, it's about the refurbishment of vacant properties. Um, it's a grant that you can get um, 50,000 if the house is derelict or 30,000 if it's less severely um, in, pro in, in trouble. So it's proven attractive to, to people who are going out and buying these properties. You see more and more of them for sale. And then the benefit of the grant allows them to refurbish them. Great scheme for town centres as well, where you see some vacancy. Um, we're in Fingal, we have a very low vacancy rate, less than 5%. But in other counties, it's much higher. And it is a good town centre scheme trying to get those properties back into use. Um, I mentioned the 6,400 properties, we have to maintain those. Um, and some of the older stock needs to has needs a higher um, involvement from a maintenance perspective. So again, the budget for that increasing all of the time, and then the whole energy efficiency and retrofitting, making sure the good installation standards and better BEO ratings are delivered by ourselves. Um, we delivered above target last year, um, 91 delivered, and again, the target going up this year, up to, up to 130, but we intend to do about 150. And when I say that target, that's set by government and somewhat funded by, by government, about 70% of the cost is met by government. That delivers heat pumps, solar panels, insulation, that type of work, um, it's a fairly deep retrofit to housing in the county. Um, good to see it rolled out in the likes of the elderly schemes um, who have benefited significantly from reduced heating costs in the last winter from any of the, the housing that have been completed. Um, I won't dwell on the next slide, but just to demonstrate that scale again, um, 64,000 of an annual budget back in 2019, now going up to 100,000. And that's to do with in, an increase in stock um, some of our supply is also funded on that annual basis. You'll hear mention in the media of, of housing assistance payments and RAS and also leasing their, their social housing that we're bringing in from the private sector and are then rented out as social housing. And some of that um, spend and income is through the operational budget and again, funded directly from government. Um, the benefit of leasing and HAP is that it does bring in units quickly. So um, it's, it's a key way we address people who are at risk of homelessness, um, just to mention that, that perspective as well. Um, I will mention tenant in situ, which you'll have heard in the news as well, where um, eviction notices, um, the, end of the end of the eviction ban happened from the 1st of April. I would say we're not hit by a tsunami. Um, there's been a slow increase in terms of the number of tenants making contact with us. We will be buying the 125 properties that have been, has been set as a target by government for us. So that's landlords who want to sell their property are willing to sell it to us and where the tenant can stay in situ. Um, again, that target seems just about right at the moment. You know, it seems to meet the demand. If it changes, we'll obviously respond to that. And, um, in, and I think government have committed to give us um, a further allocation if that's necessary. But for now, it's a steady as you go. Um, we're able to cope with anybody who's risk, at risk of homelessness. We're able to find solutions for them. Um, still a challenge. I'm not going to underestimate that. Or, um, but at the same time, 
it is our business. It's, it, it is a job that we're used to doing, supporting tenants. Um, and I know our housing staff will always work um, their hardest to make sure no one ends up in homelessness. Um, and where they do, we work even harder to make sure that they exit from homelessness as quickly as possible. Moving on then to community and sports. Um, with a growing population and a young population, and of course, a diverse population, that integration piece, making sure people have um, a place to gather and um, be a community is important to us. And um, we have about 35 community centers. Some of those are older than others and many require upgrades. Again, a significant work program in that area. Um, we've taken on a new community center, which was previously owned by the church. Um, and again, just to help that community to make sure they get supports for running the community center. The large round building on the right hand side of that slide, which looks a bit like Newgrange, is a new centre that we've just started to build in Meekstown, um, just there on the city fringe in Fingal County Council, but a, a very densely populated area uh, with the young population that's, that needs a new community centre. So you'll see it there, state of the art community centre in the planning um, for some time, but delighted to get it on site. Um, that will be funded from a combination of development levies and from our own funds. And again, a new role that we've taken on in, in the last year is the Ukrainian response. Um, we, we deal with the, some of the emergency accommodation. We also deal with that integration piece. I'm conscious that a lot of our hotels um, are as hotel beds are in use to support the Ukrainian refugees. But again, we're rolling out some of the schemes to, to deal with the direct accommodation by private owners um, and also um, that integration piece and dealing with all the other response agencies to make sure there are no gaps in the service provision. So again, a new, a new job or a new role responsibility for us, but we've taken that on in the last year and trying to roll it out in a strong way so that no difficulties arise in the county. Um, and again, community and sports is, is led by Director Robert Burns. Environment, Climate Action and Active Travel, um, led by Director David Storey. Um, again, you have seen the work in the county just in terms of rolling out protected cycleways right in our towns and villages, mobility management plans as well, and also active travel plans for, for our towns so that there's an integrated planning system in place. Um, the key projects for mobility and active travel plans this year would be Balbriggan and Skerries. We do a lot of work with schools trying to get um, children to move away from the car um, in terms of their parents dropping them to school and also, but you know, moving that, removing that congestion, but trying to make it safe for children to walk and cycle to school. And obviously the, ro the rollout of bike sharing and e-bikes, key to getting more people using this as a mode of transport, but also to having our town centres a bit more user friendly. And I hope that will deliver a business support ultimately um, to all of our businesses in the county as well. Um, just on terms of budget, then a budget in 22 of 25 million, 34 projects, similar enough budget this year. You'll see that um, we have a combination of projects in the planning um, and also on site with um, about a quarter of our projects on site this year. Key project to be delivered um, in 2023 um, will be the R132. That could be from here in Swords up to Balbriggan. Um, and then uh, the planning of a of active travel between Swords and the airport as well. So you'll see some of those in place already and more under construction. Um, there's a list of projects on the next slide. I'm not going to go through it, but it does give an indication that it's right across, across the county and how the spend will happen. Um, so a lot of work in that area, quite a new area for us um, at this scale of activity. Um, and it's a key priority for the government um, with Eamon Ryan, the, the minister for, for this uh, at a government level. Again, just further information on that on the next slide. The, the school safer routes to school is a great project. The school streets, you know, again, just basically, particularly at primary school level, introducing a new way for ch to children and their families, and making the streets more friendly for them, and giving families the confidence to 
to allow their children walk and cycle to school. We have a walk-in and cycling officer whose job is exactly that. We build the cycle lanes and then we have to make sure people use them. So again, to try and encourage that use and get it happening where it can. Um, so there you go, that's, that's um, what's happening in 23 in that area. And um, the next project or slide gives you some idea of the types of projects um, the protected cycle lanes, obviously, from a safety perspective, are the best um, solution um, where they're segregated from, from traffic um, where at all possible. And again, encouraging people to walk and cycle. I'd share on the next slide, I suppose, some of the numbers there, but just to show you the growth in that area. Um, I suppose one of the issues that's becoming more obvious is Bike storage can be quite a difficulty for people who live in, in apartments or other types of housing where storage is not um, in great supply. So again, they may not want to sacrifice that storage for bikes and the bike sharing and having those schemes available to them. No more than car sharing is proving um, really popular um, across the county, but also that integrate, you know, right across the Dublin region, you know, where you can pick up a bike in the town centre and, and bring it out to Fingal, where you live, you know, that cooperation between ourselves and Dublin City being important in that space and being led out by, by David Storey um, as a director. So 20,000 bike share journeys in 22 and growing is, is the key point there. Um, the Dublin region have just gone to tender for a charging infrastructure um, in the last two weeks. So again, to be rolled out in the likes of public car parks, fast charging infrastructure to be available for those with electric cars. And again, making sure that um, there's more availability right throughout the region and in Fingal, of course. Um, again, an area that we're new to, um, we provide the site, the energy provider uh, invests in the infrastructure and a win-win then for the private um, owner of the electric vehicle. So um, more to be seen in that space in the coming year or so. Um, on the climate action plan, and again, I suppose almost at the end of the current one and looking to, to um, I suppose, move forward to our new one with, with new government guidance recently issued. Um, but just to show you the types of um, improvements that have happened in the last um, number of years. Um, as a local authority, I suppose, we have been quite successful in reducing our um, energy use. To some extent, I suppose we've done what was easier to do than perhaps making the next savings. But the next part of our plan will include the, the like so solar panels on some of our council buildings um, and projects already underway to deliver on some of that infrastructure in the coming year as well. Um, so moving on then to planning and strategic infrastructure. The st strategic infrastructure part of that, I've mentioned some of these projects. The photo there um, of the new glass house in Argyllen and Skerries, um, not as new, I, I should say, restored glass house. Um, again, that's a project that opened last year. And the, below that is the Porterstown athletics track and all weather pitch. First project of its type in the county, probably the first project of its type developed by a local authority should be completed by the end of June this year. The athletics track, the only thing remaining to do is the lane of the athletics track, which is weather dependent. So we will be doing that from um, in the next week or so. We hope to start and get it, to, get it laid within eight weeks or so. So you see the scale of that facility, very intense sports use popular, po um, possible on that type of facility. We recently opened an all weather pitch in, in River Valley as well. And that was funded from, part funded by the airport as um, a community investment as resulting from the new runway. And again, we opened a, a new park in Old Town Swords as well. That's on the west of Swords on the Rathby Road in the last couple of months. So a lot of investment by us in recreational facilities needed because we have a young population and a growing population, um, but for intense use. So to be shared amongst sports codes and clubs um, and to be used for seven days a week for as long 
of hours as possible. And that's the benefit of having this type of facilities over the traditional grass pitch. Some of the planned projects are there as well. You'll see right across the county, new projects planned. I mentioned infrastructure. Um, I suppose to some extent, the building of roads is not, um, I suppose, a, a strategic priority for government in terms of their um, national transport policy. However, sometimes they're necessary, whether it's to open economic lands, improve the servicing of economic lands, or to open housing lands. The first two projects there, the Hole in the Wall Road, that was to service housing lands there in the city fringe in Balgriffin. The Churchfields Link Road um, services the housing land I mentioned earlier in terms of the housing project, the, the thousand units in Churchfields, but also that link to Damastown. Um, and the Snugber Interchange, probably, probably the biggest project that we've taken on for some time. It's there, um, a new bridge across the N3, linking up to the Enterprise Zone and the jobs there. Um, will be finished um, in the next six months or so, um, but a major project and has happened quite well, I think, without um, much disruption to the area. And again, we'll be we'll stop that queuing on the N3 in, in the morning by workers going to the Dublin Enterprise Zone to work. Um, and some of the other projects are there as well. We're about to get on site with the Ongar Barn Hill Road, and that's connected to housing development. Um, a planning permission that was granted last week as well. So again, projects that are underway, uh, significant spend, um, mostly funded by government, some development contributions as well. Um, and you'll see the major strategic greenways, most of them destination tourism projects, planning permission for the Royal Canal to go in this year. Um, the Fingal Coastal Way planning permission probably mid next year, Sutton Malahide planning application this year as well. Um, and the M3 improvements is a project on behalf of TII um, to, to widen the M3 um, as you head there to the, the M50 interchange. Um, so a lot of infrastructure investment, more than I say the last 20 years, to be honest, all of them progressing well through the planning stage. Planning getting very complex um, and um, requiring a lot of expertise. You'll be aware of the, um, the amount of judicial reviews that are happening to projects at the moment. So we do have to be careful in our planning to make sure we can def defend our process if necessary, if, if the projects ultimately end up going through the courts. Um, I won't dwell on the forward planning, but you'll see again, always an eye to the next project or the next land that's suitable for development um, um, with projects well underway there and the new development plan in place. Um, on the next slide then, just some of the projects that, that, have, um, that are, have been completed. Um, from an economic development perspective, I always believe it begins with the development plan, having your land use plan right, so you know where suitable land uses can happen. Um, but we have more strategies beyond that in terms of the Dublin Belfast economic strategy um, and some of the others that are listed there, as well as the Fingo local economic and community plan. So just to make sure that we have that overall um, planning piece correct and that businesses know where they stand, there's certainty for them when they want to locate in their the county or to grow their business in the county and that's the purpose of these strategies as a promotional tool but also just to give that planning strategy um, so that businesses can come and locate in the county with certainty and know the benefit of doing so and also where they can secure planning permission for example um, and in a more straightforward way. Town Centre First is a government strategy as well. Um, and again, we now have a Town Centre First officer whose job is basically to look at our town centres, see what needs to be improved, attract funding in, but to work with the community and businesses to do the right thing for each of the towns and try and do address any gaps, particularly economic gaps in the area, but also to get people living in the town centres, which I think will be to the benefits of smaller retail retailers, for example, similar to what happened during COVID. Economic development is led by John Quinlevin, who will have a you'll have a chance to meet um, shortly. And again, driving strong economic plans, looking outwards, you know, dealing with um, external stakeholders, such as the Chamber of Commerce, making sure that we are um, not working in a vacuum, making sure that our policies suit 
the policies that are needed by all the stakeholders in the county and um, the IDA um, Enterprise Ireland and others as well, very strong in the area. And of course, the work of the local enterprise office being key to the supports that are offered to businesses. We have um, a strong budget then on the next slide as well. Um, again, um, just to, to mention event management and glad to be back in business in that space. Flavours of Fingal will happen again this year. The concerts in Malahide again um, already announced. Um, but also the likes of St. Patrick's Day parades and other things getting back to normal this year, which I'm delighted with. Um, and I hope you'll have found a benefit from them in your towns and villages um, um, in March. In Flavours of Fingal, we're making a big effort to get the, the Fingal back into Flavours and really wanting to attract the local businesses to that event to make sure that they get the benefit from it. So I know there's a lot of work going on by John and others to try and secure that for the event um, in, in at the end of June, I think it is. John will give you the date just for certainty later on. Um, and again, a strong capital or capital program for economic development on the next slide. Um, I mentioned the source cultural quarter. You know, we have been talking about that. Um, it's a complex project to design. Um, so now we're talking about it from the perspective of getting on site. You know, it's exciting, exciting times to get on site um, and to get building a project of this significance. Just to mention anybody who knows swords um, across the road from that site on Sea Town Road are some standard semi-detached houses. Again, Aligned with the development of the cultural quarter will be a redevelopment of the housing site, delivering um, apartments um, for, for the town as well. Um, a, a nice design site that's available on our website to look at, but just to, make, to minimize disruption with an integrated construction plan to try and get both of those projects delivered seamlessly without um, disruption to the town of Swords. Uh, industrial development is a key area for us as always, we do have industrial land that is available for suitable enterprises who want to locate in the county. We have used it previously to secure some big investors, um, the likes of IBM um, initially, um, and things have moved on since then, but also a lot of the big pharma that have located in Dublin 15, many are located on land that was previously owned by the council. We're very anxious to get development in Balbriggan happening and to promote that as an area for economic development. We own a lot of land in that location that's suitable for that purpose. And so any of you businesses that are interested in that area, um, talk to us and we'll try and do our best to help you. Um, just the Grand Hall there in Malahide is a facility, a tourism investment facility that we invested in and opened in 2022. Um, I'm sorry for taking so long to go through that presentation. I hope you found it interesting and that there was information that you'll take away um, and maybe talk to us about again. I'm available now, as is John, to answer any questions you may have. Um, and again, thank you for taking the time to, to attend the seminar this morning. Over to you, Anthony. Hi, thank you very much, Anne-Marie, for what was uh, a very comprehensive overview of what Fingal County Council are involved in, right across all the different apartments that you have. And it's uh, it, a lot of people don't understand the, the, the depth and the reach of the local authority into the region where they live. And uh, I know when I came into this job, I was actually surprised with the, the amount of activity that someone like Fingal County Council has and the impact it has on the locality. Just just one one point on that. And I, you mentioned earlier on about the uh, the various strategic committees you've got. And like I, what I would say to that is that I would, I would encourage businesses to, uh, I would encourage businesses to uh, positively engage with those strategic policy committees where they can and volunteer if they want to come on it, any of the committees involved. I know that sometimes they're oversubscribed, maybe sometimes they're not, but for people to step forward to uh, help out and contribute to the local community in conjunction with the local authority, because you did mention that, you know, you're very conscious of the fact you don't want to work in a vacuum. And uh, I, I would encourage people to take part in, in everything you do, so in, in order to support you. So. Thanks for that. We have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, uh, one of them is uh, in relation to, like one of the things that we find out in our business sentiment surveys, and we've just, we're just about to release one very shortly, um, is that housing, obviously, it's the, 
the the key issue of the, of the day, I suppose. And um, it's it, it, what we found in this particular survey is that rising costs for businesses is number one, and number two is housing. But housing still features up there. And uh, is that the investment in housing? At a, it's one hundred one million, I think, for this year. Is it liable to increase year on year? or stay the same. I know it's been a significant increase the last couple of years, or is there a, a likelihood for significantly more funds to be channeled into the provision of housing uh, within Fingal? Because Fingal is probably the growing, fastest growing area in the country. So is, is it getting an exponential increase in the additional funding? Thank, thanks, Anthony. I'd have to say, first of all, funding is not a barrier to housing delivery, or delivery right now. Um, what are the barriers? And I mean that from a local authority perspective. It is a barrier from the private sector perspective. Um, their cost of housing delivery does not does not match the ability of the customer to pay. So, for example, the apartments are are difficult to deliver right now. The unit cost is high, but there's a lot of work going happening in that area. Um, and also, I suppose I would say some of the changes to planning recently will help that issue. We've got some very good planning permissions for the county through in the last month in excess of 4,000 units. They're schemes that are at an appropriate density, but not so high a density that they're unviable. So I know from dealing with a lot of the main landowners and developers in the county, that they're more optimistic now, having secured those permissions, that they will get on site and get building. Um, so it's a complicated problem. Um, money from a social housing perspective is not a difficulty. Um, Mobilising on site does take time. Um, and that apartment issue where private supply is slowing has caused a difficulty in the last 18 months. Um, but I think the fact that there's some change to the planning permissions will help that. But listen, it's not a problem that can be solved overnight. And um, the key thing is that we deal with each of the problems and address them. I'm leading on a Dublin Housing Delivery Task Force. That's a task force that involves all the key players in housing supply in, um, in the country, um, including at a senior departmental level. We're working hard to try and address all the barriers Dublin City has probably more of a difficulty than Fingal has because we are have traditionally delivered an affordable product, but it centres around apartment delivery and how we can make those viable and a lot of work going on in that space. So I just want to reassure everybody that the work is intense, just trying to unblock all of those barriers. Um, and that includes infrastructure project delivery. I mentioned some of the projects that we've done, purely building um, an access road or a distributor road in order to open up housing lands. So that type of forward planning and delivery is essential to deal with the housing crisis. Um, and I'd, not all the works, not all of the problems have been addressed, but I think we're always a long way to solving problems when we know them. So just to reassure everybody that works well underway and those, the key part of the solution I'd say is though, that four, those 4,000 units that were permitted in the last month, which I see getting on site almost immediately. Um, so that's that will do a lot for the Fingal housing supply, um, but more work to be done, no doubt, in that area. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, one of the, the remarkable statistics, statistics, statistics you came up with was that of the street lighting, 96% of it is now LED. That's a huge number. You know, it's especially from where we were. I remember, you know, a couple of years ago, when this project started. Um, you know, the, the 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 installation of these around the country, and uh, there must be thousands and thousands of streetlights within just Fingal, and yet ninety six percent are LED. That's a, rem a remarkable figure. Um, so obviously, well done, well done there. But one of the things you, you mentioned earlier as well was the uh, is the, the 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 question actually was about the. Um, the upgrading of the housing for um, uh, the say for retrofits and so on. And uh, is there a policy of doing a complete retrofit for all of the houses that you're going to do, or is it just going to be solar panels on the roof or? 
is right. when they like right touch retrofit. What's the what's it's what's the plan? An absolute requirement to do the deep retrofit. Um, we need to achieve a BER rating um, of of two, I think. So we're effectively delivering A energy rated houses where possible. Um, it's complete upgrade of the heating system, insulation, solar panels, anything that helps with improving the energy efficiency of the house. It's a spend of about 110,000 per house or so and a grant of about 70. Um, so we are going above um, what the grant will allow us to do. And that there's a, a reason for that. It's a, because it's a deep, retrofit um, we there are other works that are necessary as well outside of the energy efficiency works and we only want to do the job once so we go in and do a complete upgrade of the house um, when the work happens um, so the targets from government are set but we've a lot of work to do by 2030 you know so um, we're looking to speed it up and also to um, I suppose to make sure that our work delivers what's required so yeah, that's well underway. And we've, I suppose the benefit of starting slowly is you, you create a model that can be replicated then as you move forward. So again, from a procurement and tendering perspective as well, just getting those pieces right that we can roll out future schemes more quickly. And um, I might ask John to come in on the, the LED and the number of lights and all of that. Um, I do know the last 4% is the most difficult, um, but um, John might have a comment on that. Uh, yeah, just um, thanks, Emery. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just on the LEDs, we 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 initiated a project here a few years ago to uh, to get the ISO fifty thousand and one uh, for all of our energy ratings. We were a bit off track on our our energy targets, but uh, a, a huge contribute con a contributor to that was uh, was the LED conversion on, on public lights uh, and. The, uh, achieving the ISO uh, allowed us to uh, to move significantly ahead of our targets. Uh, I think from memory, there's about fifty thousand public lights in the county. Um, I, I, it's a it's a huge figure, um, and there's it's an ongoing project. Uh, a, a lot of it uh, has been achieved over the years by uh, having electrical engineers uh, and a dedicated project to it. Uh, there was a decision taken about five years ago to to commit fully to it and get get that that project delivered. And uh, like Anne Marie says, the the last <clears throat> those last few are kind of random lights that are out there in difficult places, difficult to reach, but they're uh, they're they're continuing to work on it and uh, it's expected to be finished within the next uh, by, by the end of this calendar year. So I just uh, Marie asked, uh, <clears throat> asked earlier uh, about uh, the flavors of Fingal, the, the dates, it's it's the first and second of July uh, uh, in Newbridge House. Um, so uh, obviously it'll be a, a bigger and better event. Uh, 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 then every other year it gets bigger and better every year, uh, and it becomes a it's a bigger contribution every year. Um, just in terms of my own role and economic development, and you've seen the, the last few slides there around <clears throat> the direct uh, um, expenditure on on economic development uh, uh, from my department. Uh, but just just for people to understand our role here in economic development. Um, we see ourselves as kind of the link uh, between yourselves in business and the rest of the local authority. You've seen Anne Marie's uh, extensive uh, uh, presentation, and I can tell you that doesn't cover the half of what we do. I mean, it's the amount of detail uh, uh, that is in this organization. There's there's statistics out in our sector that we provide in the region of 900 services to the public uh, and to business across the whole range uh, and uh, um, Anne Marie's uh, presentation will give you a sense of that but not the full uh, range it's a very complex organization very difficult to navigate uh, even for ourselves internally uh, so our role here in economic development is to act as a guide for yourselves in business uh, and to put you direct you to the right part of the organization uh, for us as well and for us within the council to function effectively 
uh, we would hope that you would come through us to go to those different parts so that in economic development, we have a good overall sense of what business needs and what individuals, individual businesses are looking for uh, when you come in. Uh, and we can link different parts of the organization to, uh, to uh, whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> So that's our main role. We have very strong relationships with 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 your with your chamber, uh, with Anthony and Helen, uh, and staff in there. Uh, we have strong relationships with the IDA uh, Enterprise Ireland as well, uh, just for any new businesses and existing businesses. And we're we're here and we're available to to help anybody who needs to uh, avail of services from the council. Look to get linked in uh, to any of the particular parts or just just is confronted with the complexity of our organization we can help you navigate that uh, uh, for smaller businesses uh and marie already mentioned the leo uh so uh employ uh, up to 10 employees is what the leo has been targeted at that's in the process of potentially changing to up to 50 employees at the moment uh it's not uh fully nailed down yet but that is that is something that is changing uh, and obviously with Enterprise Ireland's involvement, there's a strong uh, uh, focus on uh, potential for export, export opportunities. Uh, but the kinds of services that you can get in the Leo, there's a very comprehensive uh, uh, website there, uh, but business advice, mentoring programs, uh, training programs, there's a huge training program for, for any small business. Uh, financial support, so feasibility, priming and expansion grants, uh, there was over a million euro given out last year uh, in those grants. Um, and they run a very extensive uh, program of networking events uh, uh, um, uh, and other uh, um, other links uh, with business. So so look, um, if, uh, if anybody does need to link in with the local authority, they can come through uh, the chamber uh, or you can come directly to the Economic Development Unit here in, in the Council and we'd be more than happy to, uh, to assist. Okay, th thanks, John. And uh, thanks, Anne-Marie. We don't have any other questions going forward. Um, we don't, don't have any other, no, there's not in there. We got that covered. Um, so listen, thank you very much for your time, Anne-Marie, and to you, John, and for the presentation, a very comprehensive presentation. Thank you all for attending, and uh, slow the fall. <laughs>